My name is Ricky Ott, and I have a PhD in marine toxicology, um, which is to say marine pollution with a specialty in oil. I first applied with Exxon Valdez, and this, this is a long story of connectedness between the tar sands and the Gulf disaster, the BP disaster in the Gulf, and fracking. So, tar sands are, uh, and I, okay, so let me also explain that I've been in Michigan for one year, um, working with the activists there, um, who were impacted by the Enbridge pipeline tar sand spill. Um, and I just, a week ago, held a jar of tar sands in my hand um, from the Canadian government. And this stuff is thicker than peanut butter. Um, it literally, I could take the top off the jar and turn it upside down, and it didn't flow out of the jar. Um, it's, it's, oil has many, many different uh, uh, hydrocarbons, varying from the ultra light end, which is like when you go pump your car, uh, fill your car up with gas, it's a kind of that sweet, sticky smell. Those are the benzenes and the toluene island, the light end that evaporates really quickly into the air. At the absolute other extreme is the stuff literally that we pave our roads with, the asphaltines and the, the really heavy, heavy oil. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which is also called ultra fine particles, um, soot, but really what they look like is this incredibly syrupy mass that like, looks like it's been put in the freezer, right? It's just, it doesn't flow. So to extract it from the ground, it's also called bitumen, the tar sands. Extracted from the ground, it requires a lot of energy. It's very energy intensive. Um, so natural gas is brought in, which is a very relatively clean burning um, fossil fuel, um, and it's heated with oils and <laughs> diesels to, and then steamed with, with put, mixed with water and used to literally um, melt the tar sands, the, the bitumen from the sand. It's mining. Tar sands are mined. It's not, it's not about drilling them at all. So when you think of oil, usually you think you put a pipe in the ground and a drill in the ground and a pipe and up flows the oil. That's the conventional oil versus tar sands oil, which is this, the stuff that simply doesn't flow. It needs all this um, um, water, chemicals, and um, sand and heat to, and steam, basically, to get it out of the ground. So once it comes out of the ground, it's still in a very quasi-solid form, and it needs to then, um, it doesn't flow down a pipeline. So if you think about the Alberta tar sands, um, Alberta's in the middle of sort of um, the country, and we're trying to, Canada's trying to export this, so it has to flow in a pipeline. What happens is it's processed with um, chemicals. Chemicals that are proprietary, in other words, trade secrets, but it turns out that the few times when we've been able to sort of remove that shield of secrecy and say, find out exactly what these chemicals are, a lot of them are known human health hazards. If you look at satellite imagery now, um, or even aerial imagery of the Alberta tar sands, it looks sort of like these pock marks all over the land, and these pock marks are these huge um, mining um, tailing impoundments that are supposed to last hundreds of years. We're talking about a toxic legacy of about 10,000 years. Right. All right, so there's tons of off-gassing and pollution associated with air and water quality with this mining. Um, and the native uh, indigenous 
community, First Nation community, for Chippewa that was downstream, the closest one downstream from the tar sands excavation, um, began getting very strange and rare um, cancers, blood cancers, uh, other cancers, bone marrow cancers, and the medical doctors who were originally working with the Thank people you, in Fort Chippewan realized it was connected to the pollution that's coming that's coming out of this uh, mining operation. And he has been harassed by the federal government in Canada. He has been harassed by his fellow physicians and peers to the point where he has had to leave Alberta and is now in Nova Scotia. And what by dirty I mean it burns. Um, when it burns it creates more greenhouse gases than the equivalent of coal or oil or natural gas. Um, that has to be further transported to uh, the where it's who it's been sold to. So in this case a lot of it's going to China, okay? So now this stuff this bitumen has to be diluted so it can flow in the pipelines. Well the dilutants, these raw chemicals that contain known human health hazards, that contain um, this proprieta supposed proprietary blend, and really what it boils down to is um, horribly, horribly toxic, way more so than the oil, than conventional oil, um, is flowing in or proposed to flow in the opposite direction. So the dilutants will be coming from the sea to Alberta to dilute the bitumen, so the bitumen now called dill bit diluted bitumen can now flow back to the ocean to the to the um, and when I say ocean I mean there are this project looks like an octopus with the head of the octopus being um, Alberta and all these tentacles going out and the tentacles are all the proposed infrastructure projects that are needed to transport this uh, dill, dill bit to market um, so there's one through um, the Northern Gateway Project, um, Enbridge, through British Columbia, through First Nation people's lands. There's um, uh, several uh, um, spindles, I guess, off of it, branches off of it, additional pipes. Uh, Kinder Morgan's in on this, wanting to take uh, divert branches down to uh, the United States through Washington. Because it emits so many greenhouse gases, um, um, one of our uh, climate scientists in the United States, James Hansen, has basically said that if the Alberta Tar Sands project goes through, it's game over for the climate. And I have um, no, from personal contact with pipeline inspectors who don't wish to be seen on in public, but tell me in private that they have inspected these pipelines. And there are two-year-old pipelines that look like they're 30 years old because they are literally being scoured out from the inside. The early statistics show that the rate of spillage from pipelines in Canada where uh, tar sands are being transported. It's about 46 percent compared to the United States, which still mostly ships conventional oil. We're at about 12 percent. It's not a pipeline built right now that can contain tar sands. It is going to spill. Our whole national contingency plan is geared for only dealing with surface oil. We have no plan in the U.S. to deal with submerged oil. To the fact, to the point where the industry, the oil industry, has now successfully lobbied the federal government five months after the Dilbit spill in Michigan to say that we want tar sands regulated separately and not part of the oil spill liability trust fund. So it's about saying no to the power holders, saying it consistently, having a plan, acting in concert on that plan, collective action, doing it consistently over time, and eventually the power 
the structure will crumble and we will have the new in its place. What companies are currently invested in the tar sands project? Um, Exxon, uh, um, Cinco, it's a Canadian company, um, British Petroleum, um, Stad Oil, uh, which is a Norwegian owned um, oil company, and the people want Norway to divest of its tar sands project because they're aware of what's going on. Um, that's just, you know, a handful. It's, it's kind of like the main players. Um, and this, it's popped onto our radar screen relatively recently, being the public, but the industry has been kind of doing this for like 20 years. How are um, dilutants and dispersants similar chemically? Right. So it turns out that the chemicals that are, were used um, to disperse or sink the oil um, after the BP disaster and the chemicals that are used in fracking, hydrological fracturing, um, and the chemicals that are used to dilute the tar sands are all pretty much the same thing. It's petroleum distillates and it's these oddball mixture of chemicals that are known human health hazards that are extremely dangerous to us. Um, they're all the same. They're actually even manufactured by some of the same companies like Nalco. It's like one-stop shopping here. Um, so that sort of links all of us together and it also explains why there are these incredible similarities with health symptoms, um, illness, illnesses, um, in the Gulf of Mexico, with uh, the communities around the Gulf of Mexico, Michigan, Kalamazoo, Battle Creek, Ceresno, um, and, um, and, and across the U.S., Pennsylvania, um, Colorado, where there's active fracking right now, people are getting sick. It's all similar because oil itself is a, is a, is a human health hazard. I mean, it, it creates respiratory problems, central nervous system problems, and these skin problems. The heavier weight hydrocarbons, like the ones that are concentrated in tar sands, these ultra-fine particles of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, are the ones, the sort of the bad actor that gets inside bodies of birds, fish, mammals, humans, and disrupts cell function. So it actually gets in our cells and it disrupts reproductive function. Um, it's an endocrine disruptor. It disrupts um, immune function. So it's an immune suppression. You're sick all the time, you don't know why. It's not only transition with the things that you normally think transition. Food, um, water, energy, local economy. It's also about local democracy and making sure that we have the laws in place in our local municipalities um, to say no to these corporations when they come in. And what communities are finding out across the United States is that our democracy has been stripped from us by um, over 200 years of Supreme Court decisions in favor of uh, corporations as persons and entitled to the same rights as humans. So people are, are realizing now that the sustainability movement, the transition, has to also be about democracy. We can't get to the future we want and we see as possible without rule by the people. So want democracy? It's time to end corporate rule. <laughs>